in a 20 meter move, so next okay. one could be 50. Bridge now. Five zero meters, zero awesome. six four. All right, I'll keep going. Um, so, for in, uh, in the watch lead seat is uh, me, Steve Oskovich. I'm the lead scientist at sea for this expedition. Um, I'm based out of Boston University, uh, where I'm a postdoc in the Department of Biology, studying deep water coral, biology, ecology, and biogeography. Look at that pile of rocks. Well, that <laughs> yeah. like kind of to the right, <laughs> or well, now I guess it's straight above the layers of your lasers. It just keep sinking, sinking. Okay, it's up at the top of the screen in the middle. Right. Right. Right there. Under the screen. What are we looking at? Like up there. Is there a rock? Yeah. So maybe. many rocks. Angular. I don't see any angular. Mm -hmm. Well, there's an angular there. Below the lasers? Is that the one you're on about? Uh, I think it was up higher, right? right a little bit. I, I didn't, it didn't, didn't jump out at me, so I'm flying blind here. Maybe like right to the left of it. Let's see. Left. There. This? Yeah. Is that er. angular enough? What do you think? I think so. It looks pretty rubbly. Those look rubbly, but we can, uh, we can pick it up. And you can just poke it if you want to. That's an Ellis. Punch it. Punch it. Rock puncher. Er, Solid. How about the one above it? Yeah. Nope. Ooh, okay. I think that one will pry. Give it a good punch. Or a good. Oh, maybe. Oh my god, I got a good purchase. I have full thrust down there. Poke a few other ones while you're there. Bonk, bonk, bonk. Cool. Like a chicken pecking. Alright. We'll, we'll keep looking. Right there. I don't want to get too far behind uh, well, getting we're, up this wall. Yeah, we're. I'm still disappointed still that I can't tonight. easily identify a rock target after all these hours in the control van. Yeah, me too. Oh. This is, uh, yeah, it, it is definitely not, that has nothing to do with your skill as a scientist. It is pure chance <laughs> most of the time. <laughs> Even the most senior geologists They'll have trouble picking up rocks from the seafloor that might be loose. But I do have a better appreciation for it and the uh, excitement when we get one. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm just happy that this site has a lot more, big word here, rugosity to the rocks. Ooh, tell than, us more uh, about that word. Rugosity. Yeah, to the rocks than the, the last site, which seemed to be more like, just like, sheet flows. Um, so rugosity is basically a, a measure of the bumpiness and three-dimensionality of a site. So the rocks have more uh, texture. texture, yeah, verticality, relief, is a good synonym of that. Rugosity, I gotta, rugosity. I want to use that, I want to use that in a sentence before That's the end the, of the watch. The word of the, word of the day. Bumpiness. Yeah. Should I add that to the list of uh, potential song words to put in our songs? <laughs> Maybe uh, album titles. A second album? Rugosity. How about um, Rugosity and Flocculence? That's my other favorite. Fl flocculence? Flocculence. I think it's Flocculent, right? Flocculent? Flocculent. can't say that something... I don't think Flocculence is a... <laughs> no? Well, there's Flocculent, like yeah. A-N-T, I think. Mean. But you can't make it a noun. If it's a sant song, maybe we could. can maybe make it that way. Yeah. Could you use it in a sentence? Just poke around in there for a minute if you want. Just for fun. Uh, books. Oh, okay. sorry. You're books in the middle of that. I've read recently. Um, on the plane ride over, I 
Uh, I'm listening to an audio book called uh, The Power Broker, uh, which is a story about uh, Robert Moses and the uh, kind of construction. It's basically a biography of his um, work in New York um, through the 20s and the Depression, early part of the 50s, uh, and the construction of some of the some of the more controversial uh, public works projects uh, in the city. So I think Robert Caro is the author for that one, but it's a very long book, but I've been trying to work through it for, I would say, many months now, but uh, is very interesting, especially because I just moved to the city last year. Cool. All right, um, I'll go next. I'm Rebecca Lippett, a second year PhD student at the University of Rhode Island, studying marine geology. Um, I'm sitting in the data logger seat for the 4 to 8 watch, and the m most recent book that I've finished was A Promised Land by Obama, and then I'm currently reading um, uh, The Goldfinch by Donna Tartt, who's an author that I love. So, exciting stuff. Nice. Um, so I'm Dejana Figueroa. I'm a science communication fellow sitting at the communications. Um, let's see here for books. Mostly I read a lot of children's books and picture books because I teach kindergarten. So <laughs> a lot of my books are in preparation to teach kindergarten, STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math. I love incorporating fun picture and colorful books into my lessons, into our activities. But the last book that I read for myself would be How to Raise an Adult by Julie Lithcott Haynes, <laughs> being that I currently have teenagers in my house. So yeah, I'm reading mm. parenting, <laughs> parenting strategies read that one. and parenting books. It's called How to Raise an Adult, Break Free of Overparenting Trap and prepare your child for success. So there you have it. I live in the world of over-parenting and I'm looking for strategies. So that's kind of where I've been <laughs> in terms of my book selections. How about front row? How about front row? Uh, Samantha Oceanac, navigator, also operations coordinator for the Ocean Exploration Trust, which is the nonprofit that owns and operates Nautilus. Uh, books. Haven't done a lot of reading out here. Um, I've been chewing my way very slowly through a nonfiction book called Caliban and the Witch, which is about uh, how the development of capitalism intersected with the witch hunts, and that was a way in which uh, women were able to be folded into the capitalist system in not so great ways. A, that's a 4 a.m. <laughs> summary of a pretty dense, <laughs> dense book. Um, but what do we got here? Is that a, is that a crinite? A snap Ooh. zoom on that? Ooh. Right there. Go ahead, Tammy. I think that's about all I saw uh, just in the, pre the pre-watch up here. Yeah, we've gone past a couple. Okay. All set, thanks. We good for another step? Yep. Bridge nav. Bonk. Watch out for that rock, Harvey. Five zero meters, zero six four. <laughs> <laughs> that was a good one in Argus view. Yes. <laughs> 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 Looked like one of the fish after we <laughs> temporarily altered their vision. <laughs> Uh, my name's Dan. I'm sitting in the hard chair tonight. Books. Uh, I've burned down all the Murderbot diaries since I've been aboard, and currently on the three-body problem. Is that different from the two-body system in which you're currently <laughs> driving? What <laughs> happened? Yeah, radically different. It's uh, <laughs> written by a Chinese uh, author. It's can't recall name at the moment, but it's, it's 
far different from the Murderbot Diaries where easy reads. They're funny. Murderbot? Yeah, Murderbot. Like robots take over? No, it's a um, construct, so it's what they call a sec unit, security unit. They Anyways, I don't want to spoil the plot, but it's really, <laughs> really good reads. They're really short books, and uh, if you're a Kindle member, they're, most of them are free, so they're kind of pulp fiction, science-y, yeah. science fiction-y. No uh, dystopian apocalyptic stuff I heard yeah. about. It's pretty funny. Like but the three body problem is yeah, it's way different. It's kind of a, hasn't been a super easy read. It's required more brain cells than <laughs> I have at four AM. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's uh has more to do with the philosophy of how uh humanity would deal with um, discovery of alien life. I'm, I'm working on a bit of a novel myself. Uh, it's kind of a story about a team of scientists went to sea, were plagued by birds the entire expedition. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I know that story. Think, yeah, it uh, sounds familiar. I'm taking a post-apocalyptic take on it, <laughs> where the birds actually seem like enemies at first, but they actually help the scientists complete their objectives. And Oh, I thought you were going to say they take over the boat and yeah. they learn to drive them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's where that was going. Here comes bird scientists. <laughs> it turns out they were friends the whole time. They just were misunderstood. Uh -huh. <laughs> I'm down. I think I agree with this. I think you should start a Kickstarter. Let's get this going. Yeah. <laughs> There's something over here. Uh, if you have a sec sure. a branch, yeah, long ways like this. I don't see it yet. Right here, in that area, it's it's against the backdrop of the sediment, so it's uh, a bit hard to see. I spot that stuff. Can you zoom in a bit, Tammy. I see nothing. I can get the pointing stick anytime. <laughs> oh like, man! Maybe She's I'm not seeing still things. Not seeing it. Can you drift down a bit? I don't. It's not that little line. Huh. No, okay. I mean, Never mind. Maybe I was seeing things. There was a little white stick at the top of the frame. I thought I saw something. Yeah. It's a good uh, close-up of the little. Is that the manganese forming? Uh, yeah, the, the the crust. Yep. Right there, Steve, at the top of the lasers. Is that something? Uh, in the rock. Right. Something. Bottom left of the lasers, that stick, or is that yeah. a little piece of coral or something in there? There was something there. I can't see it, though. I, I thought it was more like in this. Oops. Oh, my telestrator. OK, got it back. Uh, can you zoom out? Stop. Well, I think I lost it. Maybe I was, I think I was looking here, and I saw like some sort of artifact. I don't see anything. I think it's the birds playing with your mind. <laughs> So this is coming okay, in through the chat. Forget. That's what the whispering said last night in my ear. <laughs> <laughs> From the viewers, I don't know if anybody wants to elaborate. Why is everyone so terrified of birds? This isn't the only watch that is mentioned. <laughs> <laughs> I want to officially state that I love the birds. So. Yeah, they were very entertaining. So they got to you first, didn't they? <laughs> <laughs> when they were trying to breach the hangar, that was just... All right. Oh, that's <laughs> tumbling down. Oh, snail. We have uh, a... Oh. Tumble snail? Whirling snail. Oh, oh aerobatic. Oh. Oh. He's doing a little bit of parkour. Is he falling or like, is that... It's like one of them tumbling pigeons only. A snail. swimming strategy. Looks kind of on purpose. It's pretty spastic. Yeah, they, they do that to, to get across the landscape. It works. Zoom in just a little, Tammy. You think they get dizzy? I'm dizzy just watching. 
Oh, oh. pose. He's stuck. A pose for the close up. Found a little niche there. Stuck between a couple rocks. If we can uh, wait bump, one way bump if he runs. Oh. Okay, you could go for a little bit tighter zoom there. It's kind of hidden. I think if, if you got to move, yep. you can move. Time to go. Gonna make some way up slope. Jordan, all birds? You're cool with all birds? Except seagulls. Okay. I've been attacked by seagulls. Uh, kind of felt like our boat was attacked by those red-footed boobies. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I feel like we were in red booby territory. They were just sort of like curious, checking us out. Hey, what's this? <laughs> okay. I've been walking and attacked by seagulls, so <laughs> much different. I did have a seagull uh, rip a PBJ out of my hand at the beach a couple summers ago. So I agree with you, Jordan, in that they are not nice birds. See? Thank you, Rebecca. I was feeding one french fries one time, and they got totally aggro and took over my whole to-go bag. Yeah, <laughs> that's why you never feed they, seagulls. They, <laughs> and they started going after my cheeseburger, and that was, that was the end of that. <laughs> I have an appreciation for their, like, scruffiness. Get what they want. Scrappy. <laughs> okay, I'll let you catch up a bit or keep moving. I'm good. Yeah. Keep moving. Bridge, now. Oh, Five zero meters, zero six four. Well, seeing how we're talking about birds or whatever, I guess I'll 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 go because um, I'm Tammy. I'm in the video engineer seat. I am currently reading a book called Fuzz, When Animals Break the Law. Hmm. <laughs> so it it's basically a kind of funny scientific writing uh, about the author follows around with like animal attack forensics specialists, managers, different animal specialists and and all kind of investigates all sorts of different things and compares how animals break the law compared to humans and what quote unquote like if it's always the animal's fault and why do they always get blamed and never a human's fault and they so the animals tend to suffer more from different things and like the chapter I just read I just started the book is about bear attacks and they kind of break down who, who really attacked who, and why is the bear getting sentenced, essentially, versus the humans will never get sentenced, even though they may have want, been one to provoke it. But it's all in like funny and light humor, the way it's written. I just have this image of a bear sitting in a courtroom in front <laughs> of a judge getting a sentence. Like I promised, sir, I didn't. He came <laughs> at me first. Maybe, um, Steve, maybe we should do like comics, little, little strips. <laughs> kind of funny. We can do one about the birds take over, but our, our friends. And bear goes to court. Yeah. I'm sure there's a, a chapter on birds somewhere in there. I just haven't gotten there yet. Yeah. It definitely might change my perspective on recent events. <laughs> Sure. Does anyone remember at the beginning of COVID when you got all these like videos of the animals sort of reclaiming populated areas? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I always thought that was super interesting. The uh, close up of the uh, jaguar and uh, I was somewhere in uh, one of the lodges there. I think it was South Africa. 
I like how the rock is at least, at least sediment free here. I would have expected much more sediment, but it seems to be well current scoured. It's just a very fine drape. Yeah, the until you go to poke something. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> then it comes up. <laughs> From my non-geologist's eyes, the geological what? landscape here looks a lot different than our previous watch. So. Ready to poke? Yeah. <laughs> Some of these look really angular. That one's too big, though. That big one up top? Yeah. Yeah. It's probably also really stuck in there. Right, uh, close to the vehicle there. Snare the camera. Where is it? This one? Uh, Ooh. That one or the one to the left of it? That one. Oh, I think the one that's moving is worth, worth picking up. Seems kind of crusty, does it? Yeah, I think it's yeah. just all crust. Yeah. What do you think? Useful? Not useful? Uh, crusty. Is it possible to zoom in on it more? Yeah. Um, zoom in, Timmy. Spin. Can I get porch light, maybe? Sure. I can get it. Yeah, yeah just stick it out in the light. Just move your manipulator forward into the light. I would say no, it looks like two pieces of crust. Yeah, it does. Yeah. There's okay. some more. Some more angular ones. Oh, yeah. If you want to go for this, you know, these up here look more interesting. Something okay. more blocky. Can you come wide, please, Tammy? Bridge nav. That's moving. Yep. Pick it up. Hold, hold position. How's that one look? Uh, can you give it a half zoom or so? Yeah, go ahead, Tammy. Still, pr still pretty crusty, but you know, let's let's stow it just in case. Okay. Uh, not not a bad problem to have too many rocks, unless you have one and a half tons of rocks on a pallet might be too many rocks. It's a lot of rocks. I don't know if it's too many. A oh, question coming in. Um, could we collect too many rocks and Herc stays on the bottom? Like, what is that? Does that, what impact does rock collection have on our ability to come back up to the surface in terms of buoyancy? Good question. It, um, it reduces our, the speed that we can come up. Mm -hmm. So we're heavier, so we can't, uh, you can put it box. into F. Okay. All right. After this, no more rocks for a little bit. Oh. <laughs> it's, it's making the USB all go mad. Yes. <laughs> Direct correlation there. Yeah. <laughs> you notice that too? Yeah. Making 
close the box. Right here. Which uh, compartment did I go into? F. Box truck. Okay. So cool. satisfying when those rocks drop. Well done, Antonella. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Do you have a, a recent book when you're when you're able? Uh, yeah. I'm trying to think. I don't think it's the most recent one I've read, but it's the one I'm thinking of. Um, Bill Bryson book called I'm a Stranger Here Myself, written when he moved back to the U.S. after living in England for many years. I enjoyed that one. It was a pretty light read. Well, there you have it. We all Craft still read here. books. I prefer the actual books. I don't read on Kindle. I like to have a paper book in my hand. Yeah. I enjoy that as well, but it has been nice out here to have a tablet as well to be able to download books. As a uh, be out here for weeks or months and you can bring your whole library with yeah. you. Yeah. I did yeah. that my first couple of times out and was like, I got to <laughs> stop reading so many books. Are we good to keep going? Yep. Fridge, Nav. Oh. Tammy, they want to hear that name of that book again. It's pretty interesting. Five zero meter zero six four. Fuzz, F-U-Z-Z. -Z. Is it fuzz when nature breaks the law? Yep. Awesome. You found it. Hmm. I just had that song come in my head. Breaking the law, breaking the law. <laughs> oh. Why are we looking for angular, quote unquote, features in these rocks? What does that tell us about the rocks that make angular rocks a target? Well, if you have these lava flows, which have proven time and time again to be pretty well, you know, cemented together. Um, we, t we tend to look for pieces of float, so pieces that have broken off already, and those, oh, I'm gonna sneeze. <laughs> um, and those tend to be more angular um, bits as they break off of sheet flows, lava tubes, pillows, that kind of stuff. So that's why they're they're targets because they indicate more. Oh, I had a viewer from Texas saying when the biologist says we can't have too many rocks, it makes them smile. <laughs> I think he's getting a kickback <laughs> <laughs> from big geology yeah, in the pocket. <laughs> I mean, there there are there are biological reasons for understanding crusts. Um, I am particularly interested in questions surrounding uh, where a lot of the structure forming biology, so things like corals and sponges occur relative to either crust, crust thicknesses or you know, crust, uh, you know, more and more enriched crust, um, only because uh, in a, if these areas were to be uh, impacted by deep sea mining exploration um, activities, uh, you would want to know, you know if, if those sensitive communities would be um, disturbed in any way um, based on where they occur uh, on the seafloor. We don't have really good predictive habitat models for these types of seamounts. In fact, I don't think there has been one done yet for U.S. waters. Uh, predictive habitat models take in a bunch of different variables that say, okay, the bathymetry here is this, and you know the slope is this, and you know the currents are like this. 
and uh, you know, as well as all the water column parameters, and, and as well as presence and absence of certain species from surveys, exactly like what we're doing right now. And it runs a model that gives you probabilities of where you might most likely find uh, concentrations of deep water corals and sponges. And that way, you know, you, you could plan a man you can plan a management uh, management system that you know, tries to minimize uh, these kinds of disturbances um, that has been done um, for oil and gas in uh, parts of the Gulf of Mexico as well as uh, in parts of the East Coast. Um, similar uh, systems are used for evaluating the impact of wind farms uh, that are going up all over the country in the offshore environment. But seamounts are very difficult to characterize because, um, you know, we really get one opportunity, you know, like one transect to run up the side of a seamount. It doesn't necessarily give us a good picture of what's happening within the whole seamount environment. One side of a seamount might have completely different biology and uh, density because the currents are slightly different in that side, how they impinge on the seamount. Um, the geology might be different from one side to the other, uh, you know, one side. That's really cool pillow. Yeah, that's a That's pretty sweet. Interesting feature. This is what I was saying about rugosity. This would be like a high rugosity feature where it's, you know, very bumpy and lumpy. Yeah, awesome line for photogrammetry. Yeah, that would, that would be a good candidate. So usually the kind of the important variables for these uh, predict predictive habitat models are uh, bathymetry, number one. So having really good maps of a site are really critical to getting a better picture of what's going on. And then everything else is just layered in. So that's why we map. And we'll probably do some mapping uh, tomorrow if, uh, if the type conditions aren't favorable. Want to zoom in there a bit, Tammy? Those, like, white stripes, are those kind of maybe in encrusting worms and stuff on the rocks? Could be worms. It could be, yeah, small benthic foraminifera. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's what it looks like. A couple more questions coming in. Why is it that we tend to see more life around the rocks and structures versus okay. these ocean plains? It's a uh, you know, we, we uh, need to put an asterisk on, the, on that statement, on that question and my answer. Um, you know, I, I study hard substrates primarily, and so uh, the kinds of questions I'm interested in answering require observations of hard substrate communities like deep water corals and sponges, which usually overwhelmingly pick, um, uh, you know, rocky, uh, crusty, um, substrates to attach to, but there is a, a good deal of life in the um, soft sediments of the seafloor. Even in a seamount landscape like this, we often refer to uh, a seamount as a mosaic of habitats. So even though you have small pockets of sediment in between all of these uh, larger rocks, that sediment is also inhabited by biology, um, in, in fauna, animals living within the sediment. Sometimes uh, in you know, very small pockets, you'll see high densities of sea pens. Oop, there's a sea fan there. You can take a look at. Okay, Tammy. Okay, so 
This is a pronoid coral. Looks to be in the genus Norella based on how the polyps are oriented and how the branching, branching is occurring. I think this is the first uh, substantial colony I've seen on, on the dive, but I have only been watching her about an hour before watch. Yep. Looks good. Okay. Okay, great, thank you. For the most part, if we uh, if we can match this up with a photo of uh, one of the surveys that have been done in the region, um, we can usually get a proper species level ID, but for now the genus will suffice uh, until we can review the video in more detail. So we should be getting into the steeper slope here, um, according to our map, but I'm not, I'm not seeing anything yet. <laughs> wow, especially right now. <laughs> <laughs> but the prior watch did mention that the contours might be a little off, so I think uh, yeah. I can confirm. I'll actually leave a note on the map here. Just a little uh, shell, Sam. There's still sonar oh targets, yeah. ahoy. Okay. Or couldn't resist. <laughs> <laughs> so there, the we'll, we'll there see that, is. and then we'll go look at this. The bathy here is, uh, is all GMRT data, so it's coarsely gridded, 100, or 100 meter resolution, I think, unless it was re gridded recently by our mapping coordinator. Um, so it could be responsible for some of the deviations we're seeing. But uh, if we had, we had usually done a pass or two of Nautilus mapping at most of our other dive sites, so there might be small discrepancies. Yeah. Just an interesting little uh, shelf there. Well, I think, well, Maybe obviously... a good place for a push court. Obviously, all of the biological connections related to geology laid out are important. I think it's also okay for you to like rocks just for the sake of rocks. <laughs> <laughs> just want to suggest that it's okay. <laughs> there, Steve? <laughs> have I offended you? I have noted your recommendation. <laughs> no, Under I'm consideration. Kidding. <laughs> Thank you for your feedback. We'll be in touch. <laughs> oh, camera. Is that a manual zoom? Yeah, I'm just playing around here. This might be a question for Nav. How do you know the position of the ROVs underwater as GPS is not available when being submerged? That is true. Oh, it does move. Huh. Can you pick up that one, poor truck? Ooh. Yeah, could do. <laughs> Throw it on the porch. That one looks chunky. Bridge, it's no? stuck there forever. We don't have enough weights. Are we stopping here or no? No, no I just no. wanted to. <laughs> <laughs> that rock looked like it be, it would move. Okay. Just wanted to. <laughs> you wanted to test that. Uh, we gotta get dance. Yeah, I need to. I need to clarify. Yeah, my uh, my my jokes. <laughs> Not serious about the little giant boulder. Uh, for the navigation question, um, that's correct. GPS does not work underwater. Um, so we're using a USBL system, an ultra short baseline system, which is a system which involves, you know, let's see if I can do a 4 a.m. explanation of this. <laughs> 5 a.m. now. Um, we have one whale on the boat, four swimming around the ROV. <laughs> <laughs> Basically, acoustic beacon on the vehicle, uh, actually on both vehicles, that um, 
sends out pings to uh, the ship, and so we're able to determine location of both vehicles in relation to the ship. Um, so we actually have a interface where we're able to see both vehicles in relation to the ship, although depending on how well that system is working, uh, there is a degree of navigating which happens. <coughs> Actually, I need to reset that. It sounds like Webster need, needs to hear about that word. Navi guessing? Yeah. yeah. Bridge now. Sound through the water. <laughs> Sound through the water like uh, whales and dolphins. Five zero meters, zero six four. Oh, the, uh, it's a bunch of things that affect how the sound travels through the water. Temperature, salinity. Bunch of other things I probably don't know about. Those are the big ones. It's getting more angular here, or is it just me noticing some more angular rocky oh, features? Rock time? No, I'm just making an observation. Darn it. <laughs> you know, I know, we are really I know. excited about rock time. I need to clarify what? my Rocks? statements. Rock? Rock? Did you say rock? <laughs> Can I get it? <laughs> <laughs> How about that? Are we there yet? <laughs> Okay. So it's a bit of a paradox. The pilots like to pick up rocks and then complain about having to pitch Alvin weights. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> what's up with that? Thank right. you for that explanation, USBL exclamation. Yeah, if you're really curious about the acoustic systems that we have on board from our mapping to our navigation systems, uh, on the Nautilus Live website, there's a science and tech tab, and you can check out specs for all of our vehicles, um, as well as our acoustic systems on board. The uh, Sonardyne website is also pretty cool. You're into that stuff. I'm wondering if there's any way to show the navigation map on one of our broadcast link screens. Uh, I think Tammy's working on something right now. We'll get back to you on that one. If you want to look up details, we're using a Ranger 2 USBL head, which has its own gyro integrated into it, uh, IMU, so it it knows the ship movements. And we're using, uh, what are we using on the vehicles here? Wideband minis, uh, uh, beacons that are on the vehicle. WSM. We we send a uh, trigger signal down from the topside computer over the fiber, and it causes the beacon to chirp at a set interval. And Sam determines there's some pure black magic, and then uh, the topside knows when to listen for the chirp. Oh, that looks better. Okay, I'm back. What do you? What? Do, what, do pe what do the people want? Um, if it's possible to see the nav map on one of the screens in the quad. Which nav map are you guys talking about? Oh, uh, yeah, we have like three of them. <laughs> um, put that out to the people. I'm not sure. The high packer or the? Usually we do high pack. Yeah, we do high pack. <laughs> I don't know what you guys were talking about. I was. Yeah, we're, Troubleshooting we're something. talking about USBL and um, the NavG software, but I think for context, the HiPack probably makes more sense. All right, HiPack is on SAT V3. Cool. There you go. Uh, it feels like we're a little zoomed in on the uh, Hark HD. Can we check that? Are we zoomed uh, in at all? No. We are zoomed in just past all, as Dan says, the jewelry. <laughs> okay. Sorry. Sorry. I'm, I'm probably a that's, little lower okay. than you're used to. I could come up a bit if you want a wider view. There's a trade off. Yeah, that well there, how's that? No, that looks better, yeah. Yeah, it was low. It is a trade off. Yeah, lower you get 
I slaughtered a lifter, but you don't see as wide of a slot. So you're looking at channel three, you can see our high pack navigation software and see where we started the dive at waypoint two in the bottom left corner. Um, and then samples collected along the way are marked with NA137, which is our cruise number, and then the number of the sample itself. And you can see that we are on the way to waypoint four up in this top right, where this little uh, null is. These white lines are contours, so topographical or bathymetrical um, contours. The white are 50 meters apart and the black lines are 10 meters apart. And if we zoom in, we can see Nautilus as the ship icon. And then uh, there's two icons for Herc right now, the two circle icons, and then Argus is a little square icon. And this red track is uh, what, what is that? Yeah. It looks like a star. <laughs> it does. <laughs> Uh, it's that's what happens when the USBL system is confused. Sometimes that happens when we're in steeper areas or extremely rugose areas, mm. perhaps. There's that word again. Uh, and sometimes it just happens. Um, but you can see very clearly that our actual track was pretty consistently parallel with the ship. Uh, but sometimes it gets this. A little out of whack. Yeah, we're pinging the beacon, beacons uh, once every, what, this step? Once every four seconds, maybe? Three. Once uh, every what three are we at seconds. right now? Yeah, over 3,000 is three seconds. Under 3,000 yeah. is two seconds. Sometimes we get an echo. We got some excitement. Thank you for putting up that screen and for that lovely explanation. Wow, excitement for have stuff cool <laughs> <laughs> and then the next question <laughs> do you ever see things when you review the video that you didn't see while participating on no. the watch all the time that's yeah that's that's most of most folks job uh, annotating the video when we go to the shore is uh, reviewing the video and they'll often pick out things that we didn't see but hopefully we do pick out most of the things so we can get zooms on them and get a better idea of what it is because it's often really difficult to identify things to a very fine level from this high up without a zoom is this just a uh, oh yeah it's a crinoid stock can we zoom on this fish over here So good. Nice picture, Sanafibranchid eel. Maybe it has some parasites on it. I'm seeing on one of its fins right here. It might be a parasite. But would need to zoom in closer on the head to confirm okay. if you got it. But if not, yeah, we can. It's okay too. Yeah, it looks like there's a, well, maybe not. Just looks quite. So, sometimes the white splotches look like parasites. They're copepods or isopods, but this one doesn't. He's looks like it was like just in a fight. Scars yeah. and stuff. That's what I was going to ask. Do yeah. they, um, you know, have at it? Yeah, you know, everything wants to eat each other down here for sure. So it's not, wouldn't be uncommon. They probably take a bite out of each other once in a while or try to. They sometimes bite themselves. Or that, yeah. Wait, what? <laughs> yeah, the, they'll chase like their tails, kind of like a dog. Oh, All right, that's good. Yeah, time to go. Have you seen that, Tammy, like on video? They just kind of... Yeah. <laughs> well, like scare them enough and then they'll kind of flinch and then mm -hmm. they'll like go and grab their tail, bite their tail. 
not purposely scaring, but no. we are a loud, brave yeah, I, don't, I don't know if they sense uh, the ROV touching the rocks and that sends a vibration, or just the ROV itself. The question came in before, which ROV is louder, Argus or Hercules? Argus is silent. It doesn't make any noise. Hercules has a 20 horse hydraulic uh, power unit. So the hydraulics are noisy. You can zoom there, Tammy. Looks like a bamboo coral. Okay. Yeah, it looks like maybe a partly eaten or something. So behind the uh, curve a little here, I'm gonna make some tracks. Get steeper. This is a good pace. Yeah, if you can maintain it. This is following the fish we just saw. What's the most common fish we find down here from Garcia Stem Academy in Houston? Most common fish. Um, at these depths, generally, Sinephobranchids are pretty common. Uh, the one we just saw, this type of eel. Uh, but uh, we'll also see sometimes cusk eels, uh, another type of fish. Um, what else? I think those are the most two common types of fish. Okay, very occasionally, we'll see uh, rat tail fish or um, Sometimes they're called grenadiers. The family name is Macro uh, Macroiridae for those. But uh, yeah, I think those are the three main types of fishes we see down here. Very eel eel like uh, fishes, so long, thin uh, tails and fins. I am starting to realize how accurate SpongeBob SquarePants was in that episode that he went to rock bottom and all the fish <laughs> down there were very eel like. Yep. Like we've been seeing. Yep. So there is education to be found in cartoons. I'll have to, I'll have to review <laughs> well, that. Wasn't yeah. that um, <laughs> review that data? Developed by a marine biologist? Really? I think so. I think yeah, the, that's the. I don't, I don't know, someone really smart must have told you that fact. I think, um, <laughs> I, think I heard about that on this trip. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I wonder who told you that. Maybe someone who's a marine biologist. <laughs> it's one of my favorite random facts to tell people. <laughs> Love it. But then someone else like went on this boat or something, went to college with the roommate or with him, the creator or up. something, I don't know. Maybe it was Kelly. That's a good random fact. I'm going to remember that. <laughs> this might be a question for Steve. It looks like we're getting desperate for corals. Is there a reason why? Oh, look Bonk. at that little guy. Another fish. Do you know what kind of fish? Uh, I don't. I don't know. We can get a better zoom maybe we can sorry i was muted you can zoom in he seems to have a thick body <laughs> looks like a oversized tadpole yeah totally. yep definitely Ooh. struggling to sense and see right now we're throwing him off but i want to know what type of fish this is i think it's i've seen something like this before near hydrothermal beds. this is a good time to uh tell everyone about our scientists ashore. We have a very robust scientists ashore community, um, including some really fantastic fish biologists. Uh, one in particular, uh, Ken Sulak, who's uh, been chiming in uh, over the course of this expedition by email and through the chat about uh, you know fish observations. He'll go through and review the fish observations over the course of a dive and then get back to us. So even though it's not live necessarily, he'll uh, 
usually get back to us. And Look at that. He looks like he's got like feedback. crazy brains. Right? That's a really good shot. Really oh, large man. flared kind of nostrils okay. in yeah. this species. Might be helpful for ID. Oh, there's another snail falling in the 4K cam. There it goes. Yes, that is the same fish. <laughs> We're not allowed to say a fish name? Oh. Oh. Yeah. Bone. Oh. Yes. That is a great name. So it says uh, this particular species is uh, Ophidiid, a uh, type of cuscule, has a large skull full of light ionic fluid that oh. assists in buoyancy. Interesting. Ophi, can you say that again? Ophidiid. Ophidiidae is the family. I think I have seen some of these near hydrothermal vents in large numbers. Both a day a day. Good name. Worries for another day. Okay, did not spell that correctly because Gucci bags came up. This might be interesting. Um, on land, we can describe animals by their behavior at certain times of the day, nocturnal, diurnal, etc. At such depths, like we're studying, um, is this still a way to describe, that's useful in describing animal behavior? Can you repeat the question one more time? <laughs> um, on land, we describe animals sometimes by their behavior at certain times of the day, like nocturnal animals, diurnal, etc. Sure. At such depths with such little light, is this a way of describing, is this way of describing animals still useful? Um, you know, I don't know about that. I'll, I'll pitch that to our scientists for sure. See if they can get back to us. I mean, there might be I, some clues, um, some sort of seasonality that is different than what we're most familiar with that happens down here, huh? Yeah, there, there cer certainly could, uh, could be some seasonality effects. Uh, it seems like we have a couple of fish biologists, folks who have worked in the fish, uh, fish or fisheries communities that say that there may be what are called circadian uh, effects so over the course of a day they might respond differently um, but on a species to species level i'm not so sure wow is it me or does this crust look like that piece looks broken off it looks like it's a pretty substantial piece of crust mm -hmm. going off that uh, Talking about the piece sitting on top? Yeah, it, was, it, it looked like it was sheared off a bit, so you could see it almost in, uh, mm -hmm. has a bit of depth to it. Good uh, angular pieces there that are probably busted up, too. <laughs> what, what do you have in mind, the one right above the lasers? One no, looks the like one that's on the lasers now. Uh, that one looks pretty attached, though. It does. But we're, uh, we're a bit close to Argus for uh, nothing in the bank. Sorry. Right. Keep on making those deposits.
think we can make it to waypoint four by the end of our watch? Or is that ambitious? Well, I thought we were gonna have to go slow through this uh, s steeper slope area, but we're cooking, so let me, let me do some calculations. Let me do some math. Yes, I agree for those of you that are following along and we see different creatures as we go by. Uh, NOAA Animal Guide is a great resource that has um, a database of different taxa, including descriptions and photographs. So if you Google NOAA Ocean Exploration Benthic Deepwater Animal Identification, you'll be able to access that guide. has loads of information of deep water animals, including pictures, descriptions of where they've been found, etc., including the nadarians, like the corals and anemones we've seen down here in the deep, and the sponges. Are you, uh, is it rock time, Steve? I can stretch it out and find something. Uh, let's wait a little bit longer. Roger. Uh, when was our depth of our last rock collection I have was uh, 27 something. It was around 2750. Yeah. yeah let's wait 100 meters or so vertical. Oh, so we've gone over that actually, 26. Let's, let's try around 2600, maybe we'll find something. A bit more, if you want. I don't think this is this isn't a swimmer. This uh, sea cucumber. I really like the coloring. I know. Purple fuchsia, like purple pink. What do you think? Oh, definitely. There's a gradient in there. Anyone see this? Speaking of gradients, anyone see the sunset last night? Oh, yes. Oh. It's beautiful. Yeah, it was beautiful. Great light. Okay. All right. Go. Great. So, Steve, we've got just under 1,200 meters to go to waypoint four, okay. and we've been averaging 0 0.3 knots. Uh, so, anywhere from two to three hours. Did you say 0 0.3 or two? 0 0.3. Okay. Um, so if we're consistent with 0 0.3, it'll take about two hours, but uh, with stops, I think within two or three hours is reasonable. So okay. yes, let's say maybe. <laughs> we'll aim to make it to a point four by the end of our watch. Yeah, I think that will be enough. So that'll give uh, two full watches on bottom still to finish the dive. I think that'll be perfect. I think we do have time to do some sampling along the way. These, uh, some of these rocks up to the upper right look pretty angular. Do you uh, change your mind on the depth there? Uh, we're going to see around 2600 what we find. Got it. The ones off to the right also had less sediment on them. Maybe a little bit more scoured. The ship just completed a move, so. <laughs> we can, if we want to look around here, we've got. These are all uh, ones that have rolled down the hill, it looks like. Do you still have the name of that fish? Yeah. What was it called again? Oh, uh, it was called Acanthonus. 
that one, that fish is a blind fish. It's a little bit different. different one. It's an ophidiid acanthonus. I think I'm in that group. Can I do a DVL reset here? What's that? Can I do a DVL reset? Sure. I'm not sure why Argus... Argus... Is Argus pointing that way? Looks like it. So it hurts. No. Ah. Hmm. Ah. It's funny, uh, but when you run Little Herc out of Atlanta, it's the opposite. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We're like, oh, look, we have Argus Eddie. Oh, we don't have Herc Eddie. <laughs> okay. So Herc is quote unquote accurate. <laughs> right. Roger. Okay, anything we want to pick up here, or? Nope, Move keep in. going. All right, our bridge nav. Five zero meters, zero six four. All right, couple questions coming go, uh, in. Swing around to the north for a while. Any idea of when these formations were formed? So that's part of the the stuff that we're trying to find out. So there's a geologist on board who's aiming to date some of these rocks, um, and that'll give us a better idea of the geologic evolution of this area and kind of when when these seamounts formed, if they formed around the same time, if there are some that are, you know, of different ages, um, what's the magmatic source, that kind of stuff. So to be determined, yeah. <laughs> to be determined um, based on some of the work we're doing on this, on this expedition. And the second question from the same viewer is, any of the information that we're gaining on this expedition, could it potentially be utilized by mining companies when it comes to the ferromanganese, iron manganese rich I mean, I guess, yeah. Conceivably, yes. Uh, the specimens at the repository are not just for academic purposes, right? Yeah. yeah. So maybe? Yeah, unfortunately, that's a, kinda a risk when the goal is to make as much data as possible open open access, mm -hmm. um, which of course helps advance science and collaboration among many different institutions and researchers. Um, but of course, there's always a you know it's, it, we're not able to control uh, access to data in that way. Got it. But you know, there's also the 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 silver lining is that you know if we understand these types of environments and understand the biology that occurs there, we can make better choices about you know, which parts of our water should be protected. Um, you know, if we find, for example, very sensitive deep water coral and sponge gardens associated with the seamount, um, you know, that that's something that might push the conversation towards conservation of these areas, uh, which, um, other parts of the Pacific Remote Islands Marine National Monument include uh, the entirety of the EEZ, but this unit is uh, that we just visited the past few days is really restricted to the area just around Kingman and Palmyra. So um, we're hoping that this also informs the conversation about that. This is an interesting sonar return for Argus. That one looks pretty angular. I don't know. Should I attach the tow line <laughs> to that. <laughs> what are some other techniques used for a rock collection? Do they ever just 
drag things along the seafloor to pick up rocks. Yeah, um, so that's a technique called dredging, and it's essentially attaching a giant metal basket um, to a cable at the back of the boat, and you let that go to the seafloor and drag it along, um, and collect a bunch of stuff. Um, it's a pretty destructive method, though, so it can destroy habitats. You can see different dredge marks and lines and stuff um, on the seafloor. Um, and it's also not as accurate of a method as sampling by ROV. Um, and so uh, we kind of tend to step away from that method as time goes on. Um, but it's a good way to get a lot of material all at once. I just want to say, as you were describing that method, I had a little, like, I got sad for the corals and the sponges that I've <laughs> gotten close to over the last couple of days. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm glad the methods are evolving. The Germans use uh, what they call TV grab. It's a uh, big clamshell like you'd see on a dredging barge in the bay. They have a camera dangling, looking out of it. They dangle it down and they look for an area with, you know, so they have minimized uh, collateral damage. But they pull up uh, several tons of rocks and then just dump it on the deck. It takes the scientists two or three days to sift through everything. Those are the cruises where you need lots and lots of hands out, yeah. sort through things. But this has the one down looking camera and a light on it so they can see what they're you know what they're grabbing. Mm -hmm. Different different types of strategies and techniques to get at the rocks. <laughs> The kind of historically, the biological equivalent of that has been trawling, so big net in the water, indiscriminately pulling stuff up, and it's, for me, one of my favorite things to do is find old records of what uh, scientists from, like, 1700s thought uh, animals were based on the massive goo that would come up in the nets, and then they would, you know, delicately pick them apart and figure out what animals belong to, or which pieces belong to which animals, and sometimes they nailed it, like Ernst Cycle and his jelly drawings, and sometimes there's like, you know, a squid with claws in strange places, and <laughs> <laughs> pretty fascinating the way that people <laughs> tried to imagine what animals were based on a pile of goo. Ooh, where do you find that information? Come down a bit there for the Argus shot. You know, I saw an exhibit about it at the Natural History Museum in New York years ago. Um, and I don't know... Another place I've seen a few articles about it, I believe, is a Kino blog, which is a fantastic blog written by Christopher Ma of the Smithsonian, mm -hmm. um, mostly focused on vertebrates and echinoderms, um, but he has really great stories about uh, like etymology, of, um, so kind of meaning and history behind scientific names, um, but I've also seen those kind of images, early sketches um, on some of his posts, but I'm blanking right now on where the, the more gelatinous, where I've seen the more gelatinous stories. It sounds fun and an interesting investigation. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's the same thing when you look at old maps and you see the yeah. like mythical creatures in the out in the in the water, and you start looking at their features, and you realize, you know, that that actually probably was like a you know kind of very strange interpretation of a dolphin or <laughs> a walrus or a sea lion. I want to put a launcher there and hang out for a while. 
They've got a lot of our viewers volunteering to participate in those sort the rocks. You said you needed more hands. Oh yeah. Just throwing yeah. that out there. Yeah, on a, <laughs> on a volunteers. On a typical <laughs> cruise, um, you know, maybe not a non telepresence type cruise uh, where you have lots of you know birthing capacity. Uh, there will often be you know an army of students, graduate students, and maybe undergrads helping to sort out things uh, collected from dives, you know, sorting out small gastropods and all sorts of things from a sample. But our collections here are really more targeted. So we have uh, usually minimal extra bycatch. You like these rocks? Yeah, I'm just curious what the slope on the little beach here is. And, uh, getting uh, 8.5 degrees when we sit her down there. Yeah. It's kind of like, oh, I just wanted to leave my footprint there. For <laughs> Come back in a few years, see how it's doing. There was a great shot. I was sorting through some of the photos. Uh, there was a great shot the other day. Um, that I could almost get uh, Hercules in up. the still, or uh, Argus in the still cam uh, during one of these overhangs. It was almost perfect. Thanks, Antonella. Sure. <laughs> Beautiful shots. Scaring me. I couldn't see the footprint. Do you? No, I got a bit dusty coming up there. Alas. But based on the sand ripples, I don't, won't be there for too many hundreds of years. <laughs> Two questions coming in right now. One is, okay, maybe I'm not going to read that one. Next one, sorry about that. <laughs> I didn't finish it before I started speaking. Um, have you ever found, you know, human trash down here? Complete pieces or decomposed pieces, microplastics? Does does that make it all the way down here to the deep? Yeah, all yeah. the time we see. Mm -hmm. Yep. Stuff. Microplastics, I don't think we've done any work on microplastics out here in Seamount Benthos, but um, definitely we've done it on the margins. Yeah. Yeah. We had uh, one. So what do you think about? Angular. Yeah, what about mm -hmm. that one right there? Oh. Yeah. That's maybe too big, but something around there in this area. Yeah, maybe that guy off to the left of that larger boulder. This one? Yeah, maybe. Definitely look, look like good candidates. Punchable. Okay. Punch it, Chewy. Punchable candidates over here. I missed the telestrator. Where are we going? Uh, yeah, I thought the, it was the below the camera. Yeah. Or. Kind of out here. But really, anything over here works. But You're going to have to be quick here. Okay. I don't have a lot in the bank. That's you can also hold the ship. Uh, it won't matter. Argus is swinging. So oh, you're talking about that way. Going. You have your claw on now. That's uh, pretty square. The like this one. The other one. The other one. The one above it. Yeah, that one. Uh, let's see. 
Okay, go ahead. You want to zoom in briefly? If you hold it out further in the light, you won't have to turn the porch light. All right. Yeah. Let's throw it. Okay. Let me just get Argus a little situated or halted. And that can go in either C or D. Okay. A lot of good angular candidates around here. Must be pretty freshly broken stuff. view of the box in action too. Oh yeah. Got a few grabs of that. Going for box Charlie. If I don't drop it. Okay, it went into Foxtrot. Okay. <laughs> Lost my grip on it. That's all right. Sorry about that. I haven't seen one of those sponges in a while. Yeah, I think there was one a bit earlier, but really? I can do okay, a zoom the box. confirm. It's right, a Uplek Telid, possibly Regadrilla. I've seen it for a little bit so far. Sit there if you want, Tammy. Craft is secure. Roger. All right. Okay, off we go. We are starting, starting to see more life in this area, which is up, kind of a good sign. As we approach waypoint four, at least a little bit shallower, we should see start to see more things pop out. I got to slide up to the north again. I keep drifting off to the south here. Ready for a move? Yep. Bridge, no? Five zero meters, zero six four. I think this is our first dive where we're just going to be on the same bearing this whole time. <laughs> Put some zigzags in there next time for you. Yeah, please. And then I get the, why aren't we moving perpendicular to the contours, people? <laughs> why are we going across? Can't make everyone happy. Can't make <laughs> everyone happy. This does look like an interesting site, though. There's definitely no shortage of loose rocks. Pretty much everything here is loose, even the boulders. Mm -hmm. Makes me think like what what's up ahead, you know. It's gotta be some sort right. of like something cliff face or something that's shedding all this material. Um, everything looks more and more angular the closer we get up.
more bamboo corals. We're starting to see several of them all kind of the same. There was another species of Norella a bit deeper that we missed when we were stowing the sample in the box. Probably uh, Macrocalyx, uh, Norella Macrocalyx, which was definitely found at these depths. This is a bamboo coral. Looks like the same one we saw last time too, with uh, kind of those half-eaten colony. Unbranched. All right, good capture. What's the current doing here? Is there any noticeable? Uh, B bottom current. No. That's, uh, yeah, it's not pushing the vehicle around a lot. It's not a lot of particulate in the water. To but we can make some. So, Steve, we have a question about the uh, the sediments that we're finding. Is it more of a fine terrestrial sediments, biogenetic, weathered primary marine rocks, or marine snow? Uh, most of the stuff we're finding here is uh, biogenic, so the sediments are made out of small foraminiferan shells, uh, the types of plankton that live in the surface ocean. Um, and pteropod shells. Pteropods are small uh, swimming mollusks, types of, types of snails. Um, most of their, uh, they make these calcium carbonate tests or skeletons that fall out to the bottom and that's what composes most of the sediment. But there's also kind of this organic layer, uh, usually on top, which is like freshly fallen marine snow. That's pretty much what it is. It's it's fairly coarse stuff. Um, it's not you know, it feels very uh, feels very soft and smooth. Uh, surprisingly, though, you can see the what the little particles are doing now. Yep. Yeah. Downslope looks like. Yeah. Okay. Let's keep going. I do. Slide north again. Where 
Patriot Schnack. 50 meter, 064. Got some more biological rubble there, maybe a sponge stock. So definitely floated down from somewhere above. Some sort of uh, relief up ahead could indicate. Did you put bubble on the res? Did I? No. Okay. I just I forgot to move it back. I thought you wanted to see it for some reason. No. Watch it in the, uh, the blue bar. Roger. Oh, yeah. What's down there on that boulder? A couple things. Something up above, too. Yep. Can I zoom in there a bit, Tammy? Mark down this depth. What we got twenty-five, fifteen. I think this is the first Chrysogorgia. And uh Romula Gorgia. Golden corals. Oh, there he is. Never mind. See him. Nice. We sampled uh, Romila Gorgia pretty extensively uh, last year, and both, well, I guess we only did one monument cruise, but the Chautauqua Seamount cruise was um, just outside of the monument, but we still we find the same species both inside and outside as well as down here. All right, I think we're all set with this one as well. Reveal the Gorgia on the terrace. Push right in if you want. Do you want me to go back in? Yeah. Anything else around this boulder? Um, can we rotate around it? Sure. Seems like the downsides of these boulders are uh, preferred habitat. I suspect we'll see, be seeing more of these uh, corals like this on these boulders. Oh, so big, big sponge on the seabed there. Bridge now. Yeah, big sponge rubble. Hold position. Looks like not much. Nope. Only on the down down slope side. One other little something something here. Push in there, Tim. I think those bottle brushes were were often referred to as Chrysogorgia geniculata which is a very narrow bottle brush. It's been collected from this area, as well as others, other parts of the Pacific. Okay.
It can, uh, uh, that's our normal zoom, is it? Thanks. Same one, Steve, or you want to? Yeah, it looks like the same one. Yep. If you want something to zoom on as we go past, you can, but it's not necessary. Uh, it's kind of dusty. A lot of sponge debris up here. Can I take a look at that sponge debris actually on the right hand side or you gotta go? Oh, where? where Ship you're? stop. This one here? Yeah, right. Just checking a couple things. See if it's crust and coated. It's been something that is uh, of interest to some of our scientists ashore. Push in a bit there if you want. So, let's see. How long did the calcium carbonate components of the settlement persist before dissolving due to the pressure at these depths? And would there be silicone ooze underneath? Oh, uh, yeah, I'm not sure of the, the chemistry of that. Um, just a second. Looks like this could be a ferrated sponge. Uh, it looks darkened, but I wouldn't say that's obvious crust uh, on it. So, Danny, you see that wall in Argus? I think on we're our right. okay. Yeah. All right, we're okay to, to zoom out. I, do, I need to uh, come up a bit here. Yep. Okay. Well, that explains where this. Uh, the rubble might be coming from at least. If you got some some relief coming up. So it's that <laughs> twenty meters the uh, opposite. Roger. So backwards. Backwards. Two seven zero. Roger. Bridge nav. We go two zero meters, uh, two seven zero. It could come up a bit. slide over to the relief here and then I'll come up with it. Okay. Should be good there. Let me catch up. Do you want to look at this guy, Steve? Uh, if you've got time, but 
Yeah, we do. So it's the same as the, the one down deeper, but. About halfway through that move. Yeah, that should put us back in the box. Okay, can push in there, Tammy. Golden coral bottle brush with uh, at least one squat lobster that I can see. Come on, Herc, float. All right. Looks good. Another Chrysogorgia, possibly Chrysogorgia geniculata, which is what this morphology has been called throughout the region and throughout uh, across depths. Pretty wide ranging depth, uh, wide depth range species. That move is just about to complete. Do you want another one or? No, we want to wait till I get back on the, uh, I got a Other ways side. to go here. Yeah. Or we're Gonna come up this relief for a while, so we can. Maybe the uh, the map has shifted southwest a little bit. Maybe that's what this uh, yeah, we might the bathy be being off. Yeah. This is what they were saying. Finally there. Just keeps it interesting, right? Yeah. Navigating. Keep everyone on their toes. You're good there. Just let me come up for a while. Yeah, maybe down five if you can. Same one here, is it, Steve? Yep, same one. All right, that's good. Crinoids, uh, at least two species of crinoids on this wall. These sm small yellow ones, and then this larger brown, reddish uh, phrynocrinids. Phrynocrinids are the ones that have multiple branches in each of the arms. Sometimes multiple, but at least usually one or two. You can get around to it. This one might be a can get for a closer yeah, right. look. Right can come up uh, a couple meters now if you want. Closer inspection, it looks like another one of these bamboo corals, but a larger colony. Push it quick, a little quick snap zoom should be enough.
Yeah, looks to be the same. Okay. Great, thanks. more readers please that one curly and the other one they're straight it's just the way it's good question they look to be the same species but sometimes uh, bamboo corals will you know have a kink in the colony or they'll have develop a spiral if the flow conditions in a particular area are uh, it, the, the flow conditions will affect their growth morphology So one of the one of the things we think one of the reasons we think that uh, these bamboo corals and you know other corals might develop spirals uh, is that as water flows through the colony, if you have a spiral, it's a more efficient way of slowing down the water, so you can enhance particle capture, mm -hmm. which is how these animals are feeding. And the slower, you know, the polyps are maybe a few few millimeters tall at most the taller or the slower the water's moving the better chance you have at selecting a good uh, target for a meal can I spin Argus around? yeah I was going to say can you come around the whatever way you have to to take that turn out yep thank you you might want to come up a bit first Fifteen to eighteen. Push in on that one if you want, Tammy. We got another snail. Oh yeah. That one's trying Spastic to go uphill. Snail. Parkour snail. <laughs> so it looks like the species might actually be a brancher. Um, there's nothing to suggest that you know these unbranched and branched morphologies are any uh, are any different. The polyps are almost identical, so it could just be that this particular species has a very unusual branching cue. Could, it could also be a d different species. This is why bamboo corals are so difficult to tell apart. It's because they just do funny things when you least expect them. All right. We'll call that good. Looks like uh, branching somewhere internodally possibly above the node yeah it doesn't it doesn't look like a normal growth form of this bamboo coral it looks uh, branching opportunistically as it can
sorry. Come up a bit if you want to. Okay. This is a definitely a different species of bamboo. You can tell it looks like flow conditions are a little bit better here too. The particles are moving across the screen. Okay, northeast back. to southwest direction, or okay. east to west. Currents are a little bit accelerated, probably around this knoll. Push so out we're a bit finding there, more too. colonies and larger colonies. We'll take uh, ten, Sam. Better, ten. Uh, back. The regular way, yeah. Ten Actually, already. you can do twenty. I'll do twenty steps here. Zero six four. Better. Better. Brezhnev. Not quite got the leash to uh, get the side on shot there. Maybe this way. Two zero meters, zero six four. Come down another five. Got a really nice, like, 180 view, though. Coming around it. A better shot with the dark in the background, maybe? Yeah, always. Closer, close up of this, Steve. Or um, if you can push in a little bit more, that might be helpful. Yeah, we can fill the screen, Tammy. I'm just yeah. trying to uh, get a view of the branch points. Do you want one of these without the lasers? It's kind of a cool. Yeah, you can turn the lasers off if you want. And then I'll push in. Get a couple grabs there or whatever, and then I'll push in. There's some uh, Aplicophorans possibly predating on this colony. Shellless mollusks. All right, looks internodally branched. Okay. All right. Uh, happy with the state of this one. Can get the uh, DSC a little closer for it. Got some good ones back here. Sweet. Want to come up uh, five meters? That move is just about to complete. You can go wide, Tammy. Yeah, Ready to keep moving or hold? Um. Ooh. 
nice sponge. Yeah, we could keep moving, I think. We're gonna keep going yep. up the hill. Let's keep moving. Roger. I think we'll do shorter steps as we uh, get up this. Yeah. Yeah. I like that. Bridge nav. Two zero meter zero six four. Some of those broken sponges. The Chrysogorgia dense colony. Chrysogorgia possibly stellata. Slime star? Cucumber? Cucumber. Strange oh, place no. for a cucumber. Tough to yeah, tell. sure is. It's on a diet. <laughs> How'd I get up Clearly, because there's no food around. <laughs> There's one in uh, 4K down there, Steve. The, the coral you're talking about? Yeah. Yeah, I got that one already. Okay. Already ID'd. Are you, morphology uh, is fairly distinctive. Our normal zoom there, are you, Tammy? Yep, just past the... Thank you. ...the vignette. Can we take the lasers back on when you get a chance? I think there's a frogfish to the right. Where? Uh, to the right of the frame. Right there, bottom right, red. Oh, yeah. Ah, this is something our, uh, our shoreside community has been asking for for days and days. Is it Chana Cops? Oh, don't go. Push in a bit there. Tim. When you say its name three times, it automatically appears. <laughs> Actually, pushing a little more. Nice record. Perfect. Perfect. Chana Cops. Glad we can get one at least. I think this is the only observation of the expedition, which is striking because really? we usually see many of them, right? I think I've seen one so before. So graceful. Nice, good landing. Chonacops coloratus. Right. Yep, ready to go. Okay, thanks, Tammy. You just missed the Chana Cops. Oh, <laughs> oh. yeah, that's right there. Good eye, Sam. Chana Cops watch 2022. <laughs> Okay, move complete. Keep going. Sure. Ready. Bridge nav. Two zero meters. Some zero small polyapagon sponges around here too. Polyapagon. We sampled uh, polyapagon environments like this in 2019.
So is this is this special front row chocolate or? Yep. <laughs> Wait, what just happened? Did I hear the word chocolate? And am I being excluded? <laughs> I'm happy to share my piece. D no, I have more. I, I was just waiting. If you try to talk up SPL, it'll be known. Especially when you mention that. No, I've, uh, this I've, actually has coffee, which I can't do, so I'll bring it to the back. Oh, I have more. Here. I have enough for everyone. I was just <laughs> trying to make sure everyone got a piece, so I was pretty... Thanks, Tammy. Thank you. I admit I slacked on this expedition as my watch lead responsibilities of providing the... Uh, Necessary stimulants to uh, make it through a four to eight watch. Well, work for chocolate. Tammy for the rescue. <sighs> I got all the snacks. I just stuff them in my jacket. Secret pocket. <laughs> oh, wow. This actually looks really good. Go, Tammy. Thank you. Is there a piece for Jordan? Yeah. Okay. It's it's still in there. Oh. I'm gonna keep it up. Yeah. Oh, what's that? No, oh, it's another one of those Romula Gorgia colonies. Never mind. Unless you uh, have some time and you want something to zoom on. Oh, actually, I'm really interested in the one in the back. Way in the back. Roger. The big one up there on the top yeah. of the hill you can see in Argus, too. Yeah, I think that's the one. Uh, the big one? Uh, both of them. One. Yeah, I, if they're the same, I, I'm not sure yet, but I, they might be. And they're just on the back side of this steep face. Yeah. we got to move any in five meters, so I'll just let it finish. What is that curious shape? Debris. Uh, like it's debris. Sand? Yeah, it's sponge debris. Never mind. Oh. It's a. It's part of one of these like branchy furriate sponges, debris. I'm. I'm pretty sure 99% of this job is just looking for shapes. You've shapes. been training since you're a toddler. <laughs> yep. <laughs> exactly. Same skills. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. These guys here you're interested Ooh. in? Yeah. We can take a look. Tips. Oh, yeah. See if I can do the, uh, I actually think they're the one on the bottom and the one on the top are actually two different species. Uh, I have a suspicion of what this is already. Um, it's a morphology that is very distinctive um, of a primnoid. Both of these are primnoids. Closer there? Uh, yeah, well, uh, whatever's well lit. So I guess maybe right on the lasers you could start. Go ahead, Tammy. I can uh, tilt up in the light a little more here. Zoom, it's it? Yep, that's full zoom. I can get a little closer, Steve. If no, you want. That, that's not necessary. Um, okay, can you zoom out? Uh, can you zoom 
on the base here. Yeah, all right. Okay, tell me. Baby sea star. Oh, it's so cute. Hmm. Looks like the one you knitted. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I am looking for predators, but trying to get th at that sea star, it doesn't look like it's actively predating on a colony right now. In fact, I don't even know what it's doing there. Maybe got lost trying to find the other polyps. It went up along <laughs> the wrong, uh, the wrong branch. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, I'm all set with this. Can we go check out the one down below? Sure. Uh, so this suggests uh, it's a genus called Paracalyptrophora, um, downward facing polyps, or could all, um, it's not immediately clear what the species could be, but it's something we could try to look up. This is another primnoid. Um, this this uh, colony suggests already it's our in the it's in a genus called Norella, um, and it's got a very unusual branching. <laughs> unusual branching pattern. Um, it looks Sorry, like Steve. these polyps are kind of downward up. versus some of the upward yeah. facing polyps. Yeah, so both Paracalyptrophora and Norella both have downward polyps. Um, but the, 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 the one character I'm looking at most here is the uh, long branches uh, with the wide a few polyps per whorl, per, you know, the polyps are, uh, you know, paired or in whorls of three to five or so. And then the, what this branching type is called is uh, dichotomous, so one branch forms two branches. Um, and it seems like, can we uh, pan towards the base if you could? Yep. So it looks like it's dichotomous all the way from the base. Um, so that tells us something about the colony too. If it had initially started as you know a different type of branching and then became dichotomous, that would be uh, another morphology. Um, okay, I think we're all set here. Uh, Good, because I just lost it. <laughs> were those that fuzzy patches associates? Yeah, they, they they do have a number of associates, mostly brittle stars uh, for these two colonies. Wonder if the branching is like algae branching, dichotomous, pinnate. Yeah, same it, sort of. It's sim similar type mm -hmm. of uh, yeah terminology. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Good up. Try and get a shot we also of both have, of them um, in the DSA so for you. This type of morphology here for the upper colony is more what we call lyrate. So it'll form, uh, you know, kind of a candelabra-shaped branches that will offshoot 
and then those branches then, then will um, you know, branch dichotomously. But then there are some colonies also that are just lyrate completely and then they just shoot up vertical branches that maybe never branch or you know branch very late uh, into dichotomous branching. Huh. But it's a uh, it's it's one of the characters, but it's not the only character you can use. There's a, you have to look at the polyp morphology mm -hmm. um, to identify most of these primnoids. They have certain numbers and arrangements of scales, these sclerites in their body walls, and that's the only way to really be conclusive about um, what it could be at the species level. And that's why some of the ones that we're not sure about, we take a little sample and you can look at that in more detail. Yeah, we, we've gotten very good with primnoids over the years, being able to identify them. There's still some there's still some uh, some uncertainty when we see unusual branching patterns, um, but for the most part, some good imagery of the polyps plus the branching pattern can narrow it down to maybe one or two species. Nice. Nice. Especially in this area. When you start to move towards um, south of the equator, you tend to have southern, southern hemisphere uh, primnoids overlapping with northern hemisphere primnoids. And it makes it very complicated because the differences are very small um, in some of the species. Are there any geographical barriers between populations? Yeah, I mean, there, there, there are what we call provinces um, in, at this depth. So provinces are regions where you have species that are more commonly found together. And then, you know, in another province, you might have a, another cluster of species that more, might, more, might be more commonly found together. But you always have some mixing along the boundaries where you have some overlap of, of ranges. Um, so uh, th the, there is one province that we believe uh, is largely focused around Hawaii and the Western Pacific, all the way down to uh, just south of the equator. But um, yeah, that, that those equatorial latitudes, especially where you have uh, deeper bathial waters, so between 200 and maybe 3,000 meters, generally those waters are flowing northwards. Those water masses are flowing northwards, extending up through the Pacific. Whereas in the North Pacific, you have Pacific deep water that's down and flowing southwards. Um, and so even where you have you know, mixing amongst those water masses. You have overlaps in species distributions bathymetrically, but then you've also got these latitudinal. Mm. This is why. Uh, this is why I find this area so interesting. Fascinating. Yep. Good for another ship move. No, not yet. Okay. Behind her. She's up about the hill from me. More of these sponges. They don't look nearly as manganese encrusted. So we, we, were, we were on the lookout um, when we were in the Chautauqua Seamount um, group uh, up north uh, end of last year. We saw some what looked like very heavily manganese coated sponges, um, you know, old. I uh, need to come up the hill and get and, back up uh, here. <laughs> some of our science party were particularly interested in how old they might be. You know, could they be fossils, or you know, are there microbial processes perhaps that are speeding up the crust uh, accumulation uh, in these you know types of environments? Um, there are a bunch of these small bases, these nubs on the seafloor, that suggest that you know there are larger sponges here, and they've fallen over since. Um, actually, there's a live one. Looks like Ooh. maybe. Can we take a look at this? Yep. Could be live, or it could be dead. And it's always tough to tell with sponges until you get it closer. Push it a bit there if you want typically, to. sponges that are brown or um, these types of sponges are not doing so well. Um, you, you really want to look for that like pearlescent white or translucent um, color to, to identify healthy sponge uh, tissue. Not technically tissue; they don't have true tissues, but you know, sponge, uh, sponge colony. So what what happened to this guy? Um, it looks like it's just dead. Uh, you know, when they when they're live, they filter feed, right? So they're pumping water through their skeleton, 
but when they die, they get fouled with lots of other, you know, sediment and debris, and uh, so they tend to turn brown and dark like this. If we were to come back in five years, what would it all set things be gone? Uh, tough to tell. Um, Oh. Yes. <laughs> it will be now. <laughs> All right. Timber. Well, it'll take buffs. I don't know if we have any oceanographers in the room, but there's a question on why does the pattern flip, the currents flip in the southern hemisphere? Uh, I think they probably mean the surface currents, right? Okay. The, the surface currents are uh, um, largely counterclockwise uh, around the ocean gyres in the southern hemisphere, but clockwise in the northern hemisphere. Um, but that only really pertains to the, the surface waters. Um, that's largely related to the Columbia motion of now. Earth's rotation, yeah, I um, see that. resulting in the counterclockwise uh, motion in the southern hemisphere. Uh, and clockwise uh, water circulation in the northern hemisphere. Corio Coriolis effect, basically. Reminding me of my qualifying exams. Yep. <laughs> but in the deep waters, um, you don't have, so that, that pattern doesn't necessarily hold true all the way through the, the water entire column. volume of the ocean, yeah. Um, there's other factors like uh, you've ever heard of thermohaline circulation that's uh, you know, ocean conveyor belt basically how uh, waters get downwelled and upwelled in certain parts of the ocean and how uh, ocean basins turn over um, it's a very slow process but uh, it's critical for understanding how um, biology might be distributed um, in the deep sea Looks like it's all downhill from here. <laughs> That's another song on the album. We're on the top. <laughs> so this ridge kind of just goes off to the north? Uh, no, it... Northwest? It's a little knoll. Oh, okay. It just drops off, off to the north there, too. I don't know if I got quite enough to reach it, but yeah. Okay, well... Uh, we're on the top of the hill. King I don't of the hill. see any reason to stick around here for sampling. <laughs> <laughs> you can kick her in the gear, Sam. Roger. Yeah, that's interesting. It does look like... Steve, I think you're right about the southwest offset of the pathy. Yep. Bridge nav. It's like cute little angler fish have a common name. Chonicops. Chonicops? Two zero meters, zero six um, four. Common name for chonicops. Uh, Can you come down five? No. no. Yep. Give me enough. All right, sorry, I went out too far there. You can check fish base. It's okay. Um, Has everyone heard of fish base? Just no, enough so I got enough it right now. I could probably ladder all over it. I can give the you a little more. I'm reaching the rosy altitude limit. Fish, maybe. All right, that's something good now. Okay. Well, some kind of coffin fish. Okay. There you go. Not sure why that, why that's an appropriate common name, but it is. <laughs> I prefer the, the shallower, coffin fishes myself. I, Chana, Chanacops is pretty nice, but, it has uh, larger shallow water relatives called Chonax, that is, uh, has a very unique. Uh, disposition, let's say.
little more than halfway through our watch. I'm going to go ahead and give some shout outs to all of you viewers watching from around the world. Thank you for joining us. As we explore the western ridge of an unnamed seamount north of Kingman Reef. Hello, United States. I'm sure various states are represented. <laughs> Hello, Canada, United Kingdom. Germany, Norway. Hello, Netherlands. Hello, South Africa. Hello, Turkey and Poland. Hello, Philippines. Hello, Mexico. Hello, Japan. Hello, Finland. Hello, Spain and Denmark. Hello, Czech Republic and Cyprus. Thank you for joining us here in the Central Pacific. Do shallower crinoids have shorter stems than the deep water crinoids? Uh, I, 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 think. I don't know much about shallow water stocked crinoids. Um, I know that there's a lot of what are called comatulid crinoids in shallow water. So these are the ones that, that don't have the stalk. Uh, they have the Siri that uh, allow them to grab onto something and hold on, usually some kind of hard substrate. Um, that would be a good question. I don't know if there are shallow water stocked crinoids. Yeah, I'd have to do some research on that. Let's see. And then Another question coming in for studying coral. Are there different types of coral? The answer is yes. I've learned <laughs> I've learned that over my last couple of days here. And does it grow faster in warm water or cold water? I'm going to say definitely it's going to be growing faster in the shallow, warmer waters than down here. I might be wrong, though, but we have a coral expert. No, you're right. <laughs> might be good for a 50 there, Sam. It's yeah, they, uh, on the next one. Don't see any uh, coral faster in shallow while. water. The the energetics are more favorable. The food is more plentiful for them, and uh, usually huh. What's that? Um, yeah. So it, it, and the environment is more more hospitable. I was looking at the rock formation. There was confusing. Try again. What do we got there in the you have time to look at this in the lower right stop screen? There's something here. There's a tiny little star on the bottom. Oh, there it goes. Out of frame. Okay. It's a, uh, this is Romula Gorgia, Melateris again, smaller colony, with a crinoid on it. It's pretty much making its home right on the crust. Getting you back So far, home. most of these observations we make of this colony are either on boulders or this uh, large. SPL. You know, large size patriotal crust. Okay, thanks, all set. Okay. What depth are we at now, 24? See that tiny star at the bottom of the frame? Uh, do you have time for a rock collection here? Yeah. Sure. Where what about this? this one right in front? Or maybe one of these? Sure. I miss the tiny star. It's right in the center frame now on a little rock. A uh, big rock, center bottom. Can we use the uh, analog? Oh, sure. This is the star? The yeah. white thing. Oh, okay. I Looks like it. Can, uh, yeah. Zoom in there if you want to. I could be wrong. It was a star shape. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah so Little tiny. Cookie, cookie star. <laughs> is that one of the cookie ones? Yeah. Yeah, it's a Goni Astrid. Okay. 
Maybe Sir Master. This uh, ship move is ending. Roger. All the time we need to grab a rock. Scoot up a little for said rock. Things look really crusty here and pretty sediment free, so um, pretty happy with whatever. Uh, but yeah, like this one here looks pretty good. Okay. It's breakable. Or uh, pretty much anything in here. It's got nice crust on it. Sorry, I'll back up just a little bit. It's hard to see if they're angular or not, but I guess we if we get something big enough, maybe it'll it'll be enough. Okay. Oh yeah. That'll do. I'm really liking this punch and grab technique. <laughs> punch and grab. Science poke. <laughs> Zoom in, please, Tammy. to be like Pokemon. Perk has used science poke. Rock has fainted. <laughs> <laughs> Gotta collect them all. <laughs> Do you really though? <laughs> <laughs> Do you really? Does this look okay? Yeah, it looks good. Let's stow okay. it. Uh, C or D is still Okay. Are completely open. Let's try to get it there this time. <laughs> zero nine zero for the sample, Rebecca. Yep, zero nine zero. Great. Oh, I thought you were proposing. Yeah, I know. That. Sorry. <laughs> it's like, yeah, well, well, it's fine. And um, mm. if you if you uh, could stay nearby, we might do a Niskin sample just in this area. Since we saw a yeah, reasonable do. number of corals. Another sea star. And sea stars. Oops. Zoom in on the sea star while we're putting okay. the rock away uh -oh. if you want. <laughs> rock is stuck. <laughs> oh no. You could bash it in there. Okay. That went into Charlie. Thank you. Close the box. Sorry, I blamed on the C star zoom. And we're doing an skin now or soon? Yeah, we can do yeah, it now. Yeah, now, whenever you are okay. got a free hand or a manipulator. <laughs> Thanks for the courtesy <laughs> laugh. Took a minute. Tough crowd this morning. Uh, let me <laughs> change the camera over. Okay. Uh, looks like all Niskins are available. Yep. yep. Target. that sea star or can we go back and look at it? Uh, I could probably find it again. Have there been any sea star collections this cruise? Not yet. 
That was an interesting response. <laughs> <laughs> Not saying one way or the other. I just was curious. Were there any on the uh, sample list? No. Um, the only sea stars that really that are of interest to sample are those that are predating on corals right now, and or yeah. maybe sponges. But um, yeah, that's that's uh, the only requested collection. Um, other sea star requests are you know, by uh, by observation. If it's gone, right. if it's going to take too long, uh, we'll, we'll don't worry about it. Backtrack. <laughs> backtrack in the nav snail trail here. See if we see it. I don't see it. Oh, there it is, right, right in the center. Yeah, it's right below oh, yeah. the lasers now. Uh -huh. This one looks like a, a there, maybe a deposit feeder. Uh, maybe in the sediment it's feeding. Okay. Should be good for the... Pretty. Is there a sea star base, like fish base? Uh, <laughs> no, there there is not. Echinoderm Although base? I feel like there should, uh, <laughs> I feel like there should Shouldn't be. A little more, if you want. Um, this thing. See the two G. I think this is uh, a benthopectinid. Um, so it has these spines coming off the arms. The branch tips are usually uh. lighter in color. Or uh, yeah, branch tips, arm tips. Sorry. Got my invertebrate <laughs> vocabulary all <laughs> discombobulated. Yeah. Too much, too much rock stuff in the brain. <laughs> now we're stable. Maybe. Nope. No, we're getting some tether bounce there. That's what's happening. All right, that's okay. So that's okay. We don't need down. to come down. Move yep, five down. meters. Okay, Tammy, try to zip one more zoom there. I think this is a pretty good, possibly benthopectinid sea star. Did you say they're benthic or um, deposit feeders? Uh, possibly. I mean, it's digging into the sediment here, so I was. It's either after some invertebrates, maybe, or um, maybe some you know, some sort of sediment dwelling, something or other. Or maybe some uh, some of the organic material on the surface or subsurface. I okay. wonder if the size of the sea star indicates what type of you know energy source it's going after. Uh, if not any necessarily. Sort of correlation. Yeah, I mean, some of the larger sea stars we see are you know they live in the sediments and they feed in and around the sediments, but you also can see some really massive sea stars predating on corals. Um, yeah. Okay. All set. Thanks. Uh, front row. I think we can get moving when you're ready. Roger. Let me know when you're ready for another move. Oh uh, yeah. Oh um, I can print anything. some of those here, and then you can ask ask someone to run down and get them. I should be able to do that at least. Circles to take his turn out of his study. Okay, all ready. Ready? We're ready. Bridge now. 
five zero meters, zero six four. Come down five. These, right? Yep. Okay. Oh, we've got a classroom writing in, a marine science class from Avalon Park, Florida. And they're wondering where in the oceans do we find the deepest seas? That's a kind of cool question since most of the ocean would be considered deep sea. The average depth of the ocean is 4,000 meters, which is pretty, pretty deep. Um, they're a good uh, spot for a DVL reset. In the central Pacific Ocean. Right, we're going to hold it there for a minute. I would guess between 5 and 10 degrees north of the equator, I'm guessing. Uh, yeah, we're somewhere up near. Where was it already? Nine. Spot yeah. on? Mm hmm. 8.2, yeah. And all of our sites have been between 3,000 and 2,000 meters down. I was just tripping out because the line was. Yeah. You can find deep ocean in Should all of our ocean basins. Some of the deepest stuff that we see, though, um, is associated with trenches and subduction zones, right? So you have places like the Marianas Trench, which is in the Western Pacific, um, that gets really, really deep, something like, what is it? Like is it 11 kilometers? Something like that. Yeah. Oh, 11,000 like seven, meters. Seven thousand, like, yeah. Yeah. Between, yeah. So you have some areas that are really deep, but on average, uh, the ocean's about 4,000 meters deep. And I think deep sea is considered anything under 1,000 meters in general. Just going to throw that out there. Over 1,000. Mm -hmm. yeah, um, over 1,000. The the definitions... Uh, Depends on your perspective. Yeah, I, I don't have <laughs> True. access here. Um, <coughs> the deep sea is usually defined as 200 meters and deeper. Oh. Um, but that definition varies depending on who you talk to. Uh, so, short answer to your question. <laughs> Lots of places throughout Earth's ocean where we have the deep sea. The deepest places are found along subduction zones. Come and a five. great example would be Mariana's Trench, Challenger Deep. 11 kilometers over seven miles deeper than Mount Everest is tall. What does it look like up to the northeast there? Is it mostly sediment for a while? That's ROV looking northeast. Is that, That's the direction we're headed, right? 
Our course over ground is 062, 060. Okay. Bridge now. Five zero meter zero six four. We can uh, pick up the speed if you want. Roger zero point three. Uh, got to half an hour for a while. Actually, yeah, we've already been going to our point three. Half up. Bridge nav. We At least until we get on our targets. Yeah, this is painful right at the end of watch. <laughs> we can speed through and then get the next watch all set up. Something interesting. <laughs> it does look <laughs> like we have another slope before uh, waypoint four. But. We yeah. might not make it during our watch. It's a few hints, uh, 100 meters away in Argus, but they're only hints at this point. For those of you just tuning in, thank you so much for enjoying us. I mean, for for joining us. The <laughs> this dive will explore the western ridge of an unnamed seamount. Um, we call it Seamount D right now. We've been moving along a 4.8 kilometer transect upslope. Um, our deepest depth was 3,166 meters. We're currently. At, give me a moment. I want to pull that up so that I can give you the most. 2,457. 2,457. Thank you to Delta Dan, the one of our ROV pilots, and I guess the leader of the Arachnophobe Band. <laughs> <laughs> um, this site has never been previously explored, and we've, you know, until our dive here, there weren't any geological samples representative of this site. We're also looking for iron manganese crusts from depths greater than 3,000 meters. Uh, that's going to help better inform crust geochemistry in this area. As we go through, we plan to make observations of the habit forming biology, like deep water corals and sponges, and we 
always get excited to see some fish, sea stars, sea urchins, and other creatures along the way. Thank you for joining us. And enjoying us. <laughs> <laughs> I hope you enjoy us. This is fun. I'm enjoying this. Yeah. It's a good uh, delta right there. Good. Huh? Yeah. Keep that view. We'll see if we can match the ship's speed here. Okay. Oh, I don't know if we know the answer to this question. Um, since we're exploring seamounts, this might be for in your zone, Rebecca, not sure. Um, do we know anything about the eruptive timeline of the seamounts that we're exploring right now? When did they last erupt? And how thick are the sediments around here? Perfect. I don't know. Um, well, we don't know that either. Um, and so one of the geologists on board is hoping to date some of the volcanic material that we pulled up um, in order to kind of figure that out, right? So some of the questions you're asking are the same questions that the science team is hoping to investigate and get more information about from these collections and this exploration. Sounds like future geologists out there. I think mm -hmm. so. Bridge now. Five zero meters, zero six four. Tammy, can you push in a little bit on Argus, please? Oh, so demanding. Just kidding. <laughs> oh, so demanding. What's well, moving <laughs> off on the left-hand side there? Is that a fish? That looks good, thanks. It's moving. Something's moving. Quite fast moving. It's in a hurry to get to work. Is that good, or you want to make sure I keep it all in frame, though? So. Huh? I said, is that good? Yeah, it's fine. I'll just okay. tilt up and down. Looks like maybe another Acanthonus Right? Fish. I was going to say, the shape is comparable to the fish we observed a few hours ago. Mm -hmm. So I, I heard you called in a move at warp speed. Yeah. Yeah, we did. Is that a okay over the sand sediment? I guess so. Are you looking for slow? No, no it's okay. fine. <laughs> it's got um, some uh, something on its face Whoa. there. <laughs> yeah. Walk. Look like it had a mustache. Yeah, <laughs> I was just gonna say, or it's trying to grow a mustache. Puts on a mustache, try to escape, <laughs> thinking we don't see it. Did you just say Almost. we're going warp speed right now? Yeah, zero point uh, five knots. See, look at that. <laughs> Half knot. I, I like that analogy. I do Actually, feel like I'm on the bridge of the Enterprise right now. <laughs> Actually, we're at zero point three knots right now, but we're climbing. So you see nothing out for uh, on sonar? Well, nothing. Yeah, not for at least 100, 150 meters. If, well, if we're looking at offset within a tree, then okay. a little longer than that. Can you show me the rest of the dive track while sure. we're? And also, another follow-up question from our future geologists. Why are the seamounts in rows on maps? Yeah, so one of the ideas is that they were formed uh, via hotspot. Um, and so much like the Hawaiian Islands and the Emperor Seamount chain, you can see go in kind of like a straight line. Um, as the Pacific plate is pulled to the northwest, um, the, the land essentially gets dragged over this hotspot. And so the seamounts kind of form in a linear fashion, one right after the other. You mean like my cellular hotspot? <laughs> <laughs> so a hotspot is a fixed um, source of heat in the mantle, um, and it causes melting, which produces magma that eventually erupts, um, forming these seamounts. Or at least that's one theory behind I their was formation. Say, there's yeah, still study um, collecting evidence and asking questions about these formations. Mm -hmm. So, future geologists, there are lots of things to be explored when it comes to the creation and development of seamounts. Can't think 
a look at that C pen over there, maybe that red red stick. Right. I think this is what we were seeing yesterday for most of the.